Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome at the fifth BioVendor webinar. Today's topic is dealing with conquering one of the biggest challenges in the microRNAs world, and that is their quantification. To provide you with the best quality information, I'm happy and proud to welcome Professor Kubista as he is one of the world's leading scientists interested in microRNA measurements. So thank you so much, Professor, for joining us today. My name is Veronica and I'm the product manager for microRNA at BioVendor Company. So now, Please, let me start with a brief introduction to the microRNA world. MicroRNAs are short, non-coding RNA molecules, which are encoded by genomic DNA. Their story has started just very recently with the scientific group of Victor Ambrose. In 1993, they were studying an interaction between LIN4 and LIN14. It was known that they both play an important role in the larval development of worm C. elegans, and that the LIN4 orchestrates somehow LIN14 progressive repression. First strike, which surprised them a lot, was that the fact that LIN4 gene was not translated into a protein. This gene eventually gave rise to two short, non-coding RNA molecules. They called them LIN4S, standing for short, and LIN4L, standing for long, which was 61 nucleotides long. Examination of these non-coding RNA molecules revealed the sequence complementarity of LIN4S and the 3' UTR regulatory region of LIN14. They described it as a type of antisense RNA mechanism, which caused that the mutants of a LIN4 became stuck in a baby mode with exaggerated larval stage, while the double mutants for LIN4 and LIN14 were aging too early. Now, let's go back to the microRNAs and their characteristics and features. So, the crucial feature to remember about a microRNA is that they are very stable in biofluids and uh, their expression levels, they are highly dynamic and respond immediately to any biological processes like inflammation or tumorigenesis. Uh, these facts make microRNAs quite promising targets for both science and diagnostics. MicroRNAs play many regulatory functions and they orchestrate crucial processes like uh, cell development, differentiation or homeostasis. They are involved in all major signaling pathways and this set them in the spotlight of all leading scientific groups, what is reflected as an exp uh, exponential growth in number of publications dealing with microRNA expression profiling. They, their high levels and stability in biofluids predetermine them to be very promising biomarkers for various pathologies. Uh, many microRNAs are already being studied as biomarkers for cardiological disorders, neuropathies, or metabolic disorders. So where are these miracle molecules coming from? MicroRNAs are encoded by genomic DNA sequences. Uh, the interesting thing about them is that one identical microRNA molecule uh, might be encoded by several regions in the genome. Uh, this coding sequence might be located inside genomic sequence between the introns 
It might be separated into more locations, or the sequence is a part of a messenger RNA spliced out in Tron, and it's called Mirtron. <laughs> Once the sequence is transcribed into primary microRNA, the 3' prime and the 5' prime tails are removed usually by Drosha complex, and these precursor microRNA molecules are then transferred into the cytoplasm. Once these precursors enter the cytoplasm, they are spliced further, finally unwinded, and formed into the single-stranded mature microRNA. To modulate microRNA activity, the cell uses two pathways or strategies. Uh, either the function of microRNA is restored using two-stranded microRNA mimics, or this microRNA activity is inhibited by complement antimer nu nucleotides. And what about the fate of the mature microRNA? The mature microRNA is active mostly in the cytoplasm, where it is incorporated into well-known RNA-induced silencing complex. Uh, based on the type of RNA involved, we distinguish two types, cyrisk with a small interfering RNA and myrisk with a microRNA. The mature microRNA functions as a guide molecule for MyRisk by directing it to partially complementary sites in the target messenger RNAs, where it results either in translational repression or messenger RNA degradation. Risk complex might be relocated back to the nucleus where it can interact with the DNA to promote activation or inactivation of a chromatin. MicroRNAs might also directly interact with the messenger RNA to promote various splicing actions. Cytoplasmic myris can diffuse throughout the cytosol or undergo shuttling, most likely via microtubules. Within the cytosol, my risk can associate with polysomes and inhibit translational initiation, mediate messenger RNA decay, or uh, uh, promote translational activation. On the rough endoplasmic reticulum, my risk can interact with a translating messenger RNA to inhibit its translation. Uh, localization of my risk within the Golgi is likely from a vesicle secreted from the early endosomes. Uh, moreover, endocytosed my risk can be shuttled to the Golgi apparatus or recycled back into the cytosol. Lastly, vesicular or vesicle free my risk can be exocytosed from at least the late endosome into the extracellular matrix to mediate intercellular communication. If we go back inside the cell, I've already mentioned that the microRNA is involved in all major signaling pathways. And one of the most popular is a P53 pathway. The P53 is a well-known tumor suppressor that uh, plays a central role in uh, tumor prevention. It's a transcription factor which uh, functions through transcription regulation of its targets. Its pathway is activated by various stress signals, including DNA damage, oxidative stress, or activated oncogenes. P53 monitors DNA replication, chromosome segregation, and the cellular division. To maintain its proper function, it has to be tightly regulated. Recent studies have demonstrated that microRNAs interact with P53 and its network at multiple levels, 
P53 regulates the, the, the transcription expression and the maturation of a group of microRNAs. On the other hand, the microRNAs can reversely regulate the activity and function of P53, for example, through either direct repression of P53 or with the regulation of a P53 targets. These findings have demonstrated that microRNAs are very important components of the P53 network and also added another layer of um, uh, complexity to the P53 network. And uh, this situation is similar with many other signaling pathways. Therefore, profiling of these short molecules is widely applicable and extremely useful. As a crucial regulators of gene expression, uh, microRNAs should be the key target for all developmental biologists, as we know that they are involved in developmental transitions. The same situation is with the molecular biologists who are working on any new molecular mechanisms, as almost for 100% microRNAs are involved in it. Epigenetic and expression studies might consider microRNA profiling as a must-have, as well as any integrative analysis studies. MicroRNAs are tissue-specific, and that makes them a very promising biomarkers for all solid and liquid tumors. As they circulate in biofluids, their profiling does not involve invasive sample collection and the microRNA might be also used, used to distinguish between different body fluid origins in a pathology. So, proper microRNA profiling is beneficial for a wide range of users, but unfortunately, it is not that simple. There is a catch to the whole microRNA profiling. Actually, several catches. As I already mentioned, the microRNAs are very short and that makes it very difficult and highly challenging to design primers in a specific way and keep the polymerase happy as well. Another thing that makes it even more challenging is a high GC content. The mature microRNA doesn't possess any common sequences like a poly A or the cap, and it is contained in its own precursors. So you need to make sure that your assay only measures the mature variants. And many microRNAs eventually differ only in a few nucleotides and therefore the specificity of the method should be as close to 100% as possible. Otherwise, you could never tell whether you measured the microRNA itself of your interest or it's the whole family. Isomers might differ only in the terminal regions or in one nucleotide as well. So, highly specific approach is absolutely crucial and any unspecific step in the assay increases the risk of unspecific measurements. And this is where I would love to invite Professor Kubista to introduce the two-tailed PCR and its uh, characteristics, performance and benefits. Thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, to the uh, topic and for the invitation to share our work on the two-tailed PCR. As uh, uh, Veronica mentioned in her introduction, it's very challenging to quantify microRNA with high specificity and sensitivity. And the reason is they're very short. And in fact, if we look at the current methods uh, to measure microRNAs, they are essentially all making the microRNA longer one way or another. And the reason is 
that we make, have to make them longer in order to amplify them with standard PCR so that the two PCR primers can fit. Methods employed include using uh, loop primers or adding uh, nucleotides to it by oligomerization or attaching a fragment to it. There are plenty of different methods. However, making a microRNA longer introduces an additional step and that automatically reduces the sensitivity of the reaction because no molecular reaction has 100% yield. And furthermore, when we amplify the elongated microRNA, typically only one of the probes is sensing the original microRNA sequence. The other PCR primer is sensing the sequence that we have added. And therefore, the specificity is obtained only through one of the primers. So <clears throat> we set up as a goal to quantify microRNAs such that we don't need to extend the microRNA. And furthermore, we wanted to sense the original microRNA sequence using both PCR primers and also the RT primer. And our approach is shown here. So the microRNA is bound by what is known as a two-tailed primer. A two-tailed primer has two hemiprobes, one on each termini, a three-prime hemiprobe and a five-prime hemiprobe. Each of the hemiprobe alone is too short to bind. However, being part of the same molecule, we obtain what is known as cooperative binding. Because if one of the hemiprobes happens to bind accidentally, then automatically the other hemiprobe will bind as well. Because being part of the same molecule, the local concentration of the other hemiprobe at the microRNA will become extremely high. So therefore, in practice, Using a two-tailed primer, neither hemiprobe binds or both bind, but not only one of them. Since the three prime hemiprobe has a free hydroxyl, then in presence of a polymerase, in this case a reverse transcriptase, the three prime hemiprobe is extended. And this essentially is a cDNA synthesis reaction where the cDNA formed is the original two-tailed primer plus the extension. And the cDNA can now be amplified using regular PCR with traditional PCR primers. The PCR primers are indicated in the cartoon in black. Now, please note, those PCR primers are sensing the original microRNA sequence as indicated by color. The blue here is the original microRNA complementary sequence, while the red here is also the original microRNA complementary sequence. So therefore, both PCR primers are sensing the original microRNA. <clears throat> Here we test the design. Uh, starting with the microRNA, amplifying it using a two-tailed primer with the 5' prime and 3' prime hemiprobe indicated here, we obtain a CQ value under the current conditions of 
If we instead use a two-tailed primer where the 5' prime hemiprobe is not complementary to the microRNA, or if the 5' prime hemiprobe does not exist, is missing, then the CQ of the PCR changes by nine cycles. Essentially, the yield is decreasing by more than 99%, showing that both a complementary 3' prime hemiprobe and a complementary 5' prime hemiprobe are essential. Here we assess the specificity of the two-tailed PCR. In the top, that's the same reaction as before. The microRNA is amplified using a two-tailed RT-PCR primer with a 5' prime and 3' prime hemiprobes. But now we compare to a microRNA where we have introduced a mismatch or a mutation, if you like. In this design, the mutation is outside of the hemiprobes. Hence, it is not sensed by the hemiprobes. But it is sensed by the PCR primer in the downstream PCR. The PCR primer is indicated by the black arrow. The PCR specificity is sufficient we have about 4% cross-reactivity, which is quite common when we are testing for a mutation using traditional PCR. However, if we shift the 5' prime hemiprobe by a few bases, such that the 5' prime hemiprobe now also senses the sequence variant, so this time, we are interrogating the sequence both with the 5' prime hemiprobe of the two-tailed RT-PCR primer and then also by the PCR primer. The cross-reactivity is only 0.04%. This is fantastic numbers. This is much better than you obtain in a typical PCR. In fact, to obtain this specificity, typically you have to work with digital PCR. So why do we perform this well? Well, it's actually quite intuitive. When we use regular PCR primer and there is a mutation, well, a PCR primer is around 25 bases long. So a single mutation distorts one out of 25 bases. However, when working with hemiprobes, the hemiprobe is rather short. Let's say that the hemiprobe is only five bases. If there is a mutation now in that region, it distorts one out of five bases. That is 20% of the contacts. And therefore, the specificity of hemiprobes is much higher. The dynamic range of two-tailed PCR is also excellent. Here you see a typical standard curve based on serial dilution. You see that the amplification curves are nicely and equally spaced. And when plotted in, as a <coughs> uh, linear plot, you see that we easily cover some seven logs and we have a very nice straight line. I'm sure you all have seen PCR standard curves before. However, a typical standard curve in PCR is based on DNA input. In our case, the input is microRNA. So we are quantifying microRNA directly. And we, when we assess the sensitivity using standard material, which is a synthetic microRNA, we find that the sensitivity is good enough to detect less than 10 molecules. The reason we cannot be more specific 
is that the oligo house cannot provide the concentration of the synthetic microRNA with higher precision. In the bottom graph, we are comparing two-tailed RT-PCR with three other methods to quantify microRNAs for three different targets. In each case, the two-tailed RTQPCR is more sensitive or at least as sensitive as the best of the other methods. Sequence specificity is challenging, as Veronica pointed out, because microRNAs in families can differ in single base positions, and those variations can be anywhere within that sequence. This is the let 7 family, the entire family of eight members. This is the cross-reactivity using two-tailed PCR. You see that two-tailed PCR distinguishes between all the members of the family. Cross-reactivity is extremely limited. With the other methods, there are issues with cross-reactivity. And the reason is that none of the other methods is interrogating the entire LED7 sequence. So there is always one or a few positions where you cannot discriminate the sequences. This is a benchmarking on biological samples comparing two-tailed RT-PCR with TACMAN microRNA assays, which is generally considered the golden standard. We are assessing seven different microRNAs in seven different tissues. And you can see that the agreement between the two methods is excellent. That's also indicated in the correlation plot. In fact, the only discrepancy is when testing for MER30C13P, where we have a discrepancy in liver and lung tissues. And the reason is the TAGMAN assay is not sensitive enough to pick up that microRNA in those tissues, while the two-tailed PCR did detect it. Veronica mentioned isomers, which are essentially modified versions of microRNAs, typically differing in the three prime termini. Isomers are very often cell specific. So it can be very important, particularly in diagnostics to distinguish them. Uh, using methods that rely on three prime modification it is very, very hard to design good assays for isomers because the modification has an impact on the detection method. However, with two-tailed PCR, we can choose. We can design a generic assay that will amplify all the isomers. Or we can design one assay for each isomer if we want to distinguish between them. Multiplexing is quite trivial using two-tailed PCR. Multiplexing can be performed in the RT reaction simply by mixing all the two-tailed RT primers. And then singleplex qPCR is performed for quantification. This is an example of a seven plex where we measure either the microRNA separately in single plex reaction or in a seven plex reaction. You see the correlation is excellent. And if we also assess the reproducibility of the two tailed PCR, it's excellent too. For those that are not familiar with standard deviations in qPCR, 
the standard deviation of the QPCR instrument as uh, <clears throat> specified by the instrument manufacturer is typically 0.25 cycles. So if we are below that, then our assay is not the confounding step. Also, one tube multiplexing is possible. Then we are limited by the number of channels of the instrument. Also here, two-tailed PCR has a very important advantage because when you use standard methods for microRNA detection, like the TACMAN method, you have to use one TACMAN probe per target because the TACMAN probe is specific for each target. Using two-tailed PCR, we can instead target the loop sequence of the two-tailed primer. And this is a generic sequence. So therefore, a single probe can be used for all the two-tailed primers. And if we want to distinguish between two sequences, well, we can use then two probes, and we can use a set of two probes for all the targets. And that, of course, is cost-saving and is also improving uh, the performance because we can have one single highly optimized design. And indeed, if we enlarge the crossover between the amplification curves, here you see 10 replicates. The reproducibility of the probe-based two-tailed PCR is just excellent. The two-tailed PCR method is published. Uh, in nucleic acid research with my colleague from the Institute of Biotechnology at Biosef outside of Prague. You find most of the details of two-tailed PCR in the paper, and you find even more information, including validated assays and optimized reagents at the BioVendor site. Thank you, Veronica. I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you, Professor. And now let me summarize the practical potential of a microRNA profiling and the targeting. Uh, due to microRNA stability in high levels in biofluids, the, uh, the collection methods are very available and non-invasive, like a blood or urine collection. With highly specific methods like the two-tailed PCR, uh, its profiling is no longer so challenging and tricky. And based on clinical trials results, we could estimate the patient's actual health situation right away. The early and proper diagnosis of severe pathologies is just the first step. Scientific data and analysis may help to identify the exact microRNA target and with the development of their inhibitors, we could modulate the disease and potentially reverse the fate of millions of people. So altogether, we can see how amazing and promising microRNA biomarkers are and now it's our turn to make them available to you all. And this is where BioVendor does its best and provides the support at all levels possible. Besides the production of a two-tailed PCR quantification kits on request, we also offer BioVendor analytical testing service, which can include all project steps excluding the sample collection itself. Our teams of specialists will professionally guide you from designing your experiment via proper sampling methods through isolation and quantification procedures until you have your statistically analyzed data set in your hands. And if you are wondering what projects are currently running by BioVendor, 
I'm going to reveal our most promising microRNA diagnostic panels. CRC panel, or the Early Colorectal Cancer Diagnosis Panel, is already in a clinical trial phase with real patients involved. This panel is revolutionary for several reasons, besides its huge potential and benefits for, uh, for mankind. We see its high sensitivity, which is crucial for as early diagnosis as possible. It's also the first panel which includes also PV interacting RNA biomarkers. And this is our pilot diagnostic panel, which learned us so much. The next two panels for diagnosis of a liver cancer and the bladder cancer are still in their preclinical phase. And uh, we already see very promising and bright future for both of these products. And we hope to successfully finish all these and many other projects and uh, proceed with establishment of these panels for each and every patient. So the last slide to summarize it all. The incredible potential of microRNA for science and diagnostics is hopefully no longer a question. So now the only crucial decision to make is to choose the best method. I believe that the professor has showed you that specificity and sensitivity of a two-tailed PCR is the best in class and its results beat all major and well-known competitors. It's one of the first essays on the market which is capable for which is capable to quantify the PV interacting RNA molecules and the protocol and whole procedure of a two-tailed PCR is very simple and user-friendly with a um, workflow from RNA samples to result in less than three hours. It only requires general laboratory equipment like thermoblock or thermocycle and the kit itself is highly cost effective. Therefore, I hope you will consider the microRNAs and their possible involvement in your project. And I hope that once you realize how crucial and beneficial microRNA profiling might be, it will be BioVendor and our two-tailed PCR you choose as your partner and guide. And now, I would love to thank you all for your attention and I think we can open the discussion so it's the proper time for your question. We got a question about the PV interacting RNAs. So these are, are, these are also uh, short non-coding RNA molecules with regulatory capabilities. Uh, they are eventually slightly uh, longer than the microRNA. They might be up to uh, 30 nucleotides long, but they are right now really uh, in a peak of many scientific groups because it seems that they are also very in much involved in the regulatory of, uh, of the uh, signaling pathways. So that is one of the reasons why we also involved it in our colorectal uh, panel because we see there is a correlation between the uh, expression level of this particular PV uh, interacting RNA and the uh, healthy and the patients. Thank you for the question. So if there are no more questions, have a wonderful day and thank you for being with us.